Mr. Marshall had a form of heart failure that affected both of his ventricles, biventricular failure, and on top of that had severe irregular heartbeats. He had several episodes of ventricular tachycardia over the last year. They caused him to pass out, not feel good. In many ways, this the technical aspects of this operation uh, are similar to that of a heart transplant. We put the patient on cardiopulmonary bypass, which means the blood is taken out of the body, put through another pump, um, given oxygen, and warmed up and returned to the body. And what we've done is isolated the heart circulation and the lung circulation so that we can operate in that field free of blood flow, while the body's still getting normal blood flow. In a normal person, that's five liters per minute, about a gallon per minute. I remove a large portion of the native heart in order to attach the total artificial heart. And, um, and I've sewn what's called on a cuff onto that that allow us to attach the total artificial heart into his chest. Um, and then I attach the grafts to the, the major blood vessels, the, the main pulmonary artery and the aorta. And then I attach those grafts back to the, uh, to the, to the total artificial heart. Then I start the heart up, get all the air out of the system, then I take the patient off the heart-lung machine and put them on support of the total artificial heart and dial it up. The device looks bigger than a typical heart. It, it is a little bit bigger than an, a regular heart, but remember people who have heart failure have enlarged hearts, so they have the room inside their chest to accommodate a bigger device. The thing that's suggesting that this patient's on the heart-lung machine is that uh, this uh, number 70 here is a steady number. It doesn't have a beat uh, once the total artificial heart's in, the heartbeat's gone. Forever. Yeah, yeah. Is, is this kind of a typical size team? This is a typical size team. Um, we have, there's uh, an anesthesia attending along with their resident staff and their technician staff, so that's two or three people on the anesthesia side. I typically have one or two surgical assistants, that being a resident or a fellow or a physician's assistant. There is typically one nurse scrubbed in to the operating room. There's, a, there's at least one circulating nurse in the room that's the person that goes and gets things as we need them. Um, these are assist device coordinators over here. Now, um, there are more than usual of them in the room because this is a unique procedure, um, but usually there's one coordinator in the room that runs the pump as it starts up. Uh, then there's also a perfusionist that runs the heart-lung machine that's maintaining the patient on the heart-lung machine while I'm doing the operation. So Mr. Marshall right now is doing extremely well. Uh, he's, um, he's walking more than a mile a day in the hallways. The manufacturers developed a freedom driver that's under clinical trials, and we participate in that clinical trial. It's much smaller than the original driver, which is a 400-pound machine called Big Blue. Big Blue keeps you in the hospital. Hopefully, the freedom driver will allow him to be more independent and do what he wants to do. You know, this is a complicated operation. It's, it, it's not risk-free. It, it does require me to remove the heart, so he is completely dependent upon the total artificial heart now. If there's a problem with the total artificial heart, he's got nothing else to rely on. So that, that does take your breath away a little bit when you put it in that perspective. On the other hand, in patients like him, this gives us an option that we didn't have before, whereby we can give people an outpatient therapy. We can let people go home. And what would, could he look forward to in terms of a, a transplant? I know you can't predict that, but... I hope that he'd be transplanted within six months. Within six months. Yeah, I would hope for that, yeah.